I've been watching a ton of your YouTube clips. I've been watching your YouTube channel. And I have a little bits and pieces uh, of your story. I just want to dig a little deeper into that. So from what I've learned is you caught the bug, as you call it, for special forces in your first tour in Afghanistan in 2011. What about that deployment solidified? This is what you were meant to do. This is what you're built for. Initially, I wanted to come in to the military and the special operations, you know, post 9-11 because I was pissed off and I wanted to be part of the fight in response. And I, I anticipated doing, you know, just my five-year contract and then getting out and, you know, having fulfilled that desire and then take those skills to another sector of, of United States government work, namely the Secret Service. That's what I, that was my initial goal. But on that trip, like you just said, in, in 2011, you know, it was nine months, mostly down to Kandahar. And, you know, just the, the brotherhood that was formed with the guys that I was working with and their level of expertise, both in terms of combat and tactics as leaders, um, as men, as great men that I was learning from every day, just it, like a tidal wave, like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and then just that satisfaction about being involved in uh, national security, you know, at the highest of levels, uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else that would give me that same level of satisfaction. So, yeah, man, that was really where I fell in love with the profession and decided to turn it into my, my, my career. Something about your story, something about your character, I really respect and appreciate. And a big reason why I want to talk to you is you never quit. You, you keep fighting and learning about you, 30 surgeries, some infection in your leg, one year of physical rehab and surgeries at Walter Reed. Why was quitting never a choice that it kind of, maybe it entered your mind, but you quickly batted that out of your mind? And, and was it the warrior mentality? I think it was a TEDx talk you were on that you're talking about the warrior mentality. Is that just the warrior mentality taking over? Because I can't get my head around. Maybe, <laughs> obviously I'm a little mentally weaker than you, but a year with 30 surgeries, all those setbacks, you kept fighting. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, you know, we could go on for, for over an hour on this. I'll, I'll just say, Ryan, that at the core of it, it was a, a very clear and defined and refined goal that I had set my sights on from the very, very beginning. Even while I was going through all these surgeries, it was getting back to the lifestyle in which, like we just talked about, is one that I love and one that I determined was why I was put on this earth. So my sense of passion and purpose that were roped and woven within to the threads of being a Green Beret uh, and being a warrior, there was no plan B. Like that was what I was put here to do. So I am, I'm gonna figure out how to navigate myself back to that point, period. So like truly a burn the boats uh, mentality but that was enabled to me because of the sense of connection I have with what I do. You busted your butt to get back physically. So jujitsu, I believe. When you, when you were teaching, there was lunch workouts. When you got to return to Afghanistan, when you returned to, I hope it's the right term, but your band of brothers, mm -hmm. when you're fighting for your country, how rewarding was that? It's tough to quantify it. Man, um, you know, it was, I had this envision in my mind in the earlier phases of my recovery of me, you know, getting off of that C-130 back in Afghanistan with my arms raised, you know, and being like, hey, I'm back uh, and kind of hitting the top of that, of that ridge line. But even when I, when I was still recovering and I was going through more advanced training, that, that focus shifted from it being about me and me achieving my goals to me doing something for a greater cause, which was my teammates. I, I, all, like most of these roads, man, lead back to the, to the guys I got the opportunity to work with. So I, I had put them as my motivation, inspiration and, and buried into my why while I was going through all this, all these, these, this training and the struggles and the adversity. So um, 
that the moment was, you know, I did get to raise my hands like, you know, Rocky at the end of the fight, like I won, but you know, it was, it was more about, okay, I'm here and I've been training to be an asset for these guys and for this team now for, for over a year out of my mind doing so. So while it felt great, I immediately found myself at the bottom of the next ridge line that I needed to start climbing immediately. So it was a very short lived kind of celebration, uh, one that I certainly had, but then it was like, okay, man, not, now you're back in the game and you need to get focused because you still have a lot of work you need to do. And there's a lot at stake. One of the things that caught my attention and has been challenging me um, is the idea of increasing your intellectual stock. So what are some ways that you initially did this? And if you're okay answering this to follow up, what are some ways you're currently doing that? I don't know if it's as a father. I don't know if, if it's, if it's um, your, your work, um, uh, the special forces still. I just love the idea of increasing your intellectual stock. And I'm trying to work on that myself in some different ways. And I'd love to hear where that came from and if you're comfortable sharing some ways that you're currently working on increasing your intellectual stock awesome question i am so glad you asked that i'm not sure anyone's asked me that before i eventually and thankfully quickly although it was a difficult pill to swallow realized that no matter how much time i spent in the gym or on the track or in the pool i was not going to be as physically dominant as i was with two legs that was difficult because I grew up an athlete, as an MMA fighter, as a, as a hard charging physical guy. I was, you know, 80% brawn, 20% brain. And I enjoyed it. My teammates, that's what they asked of me. It was kind of a win-win for everybody. Once I came to that realization, it was like, okay, how do I increase my value otherwise to make up the gap for what I'm going to lose physically? And you know, when you think about a Green Beret or a Navy SEAL or an Army Ranger or anyone that's in the special operations community, you typically think of the cool guy stuff, like kicking down doors, shooting bad guys in the face, jumping out of planes, blowing shit up, right? Like that stuff, which is stuff that we certainly do, but there are an entirely different host of skill sets uh, that really make us successful, kind of the softer side of our business. So I knew that at this point, of my career that those things existed. Uh, I didn't do any of those things prior, but I knew that they were there and they were valuable. So I essentially just forced myself into those different lanes, which started for me in the hospital. So like rather than reading about kinesiology and exercise physiology and nutrition yeah. and combatives and marksmanship, like those were, that was the type of information that I would consume when I would be reading or studying. Rather than that, I was reading about cultural dynamics of Afghanistan. I was reading about campaign planning, military strategy. I was increasing my foreign language capacity. So I really went down this like crazy nerd road of all these things that we do, uh, operating mostly on blind faith that that would provide the value gap that I needed to make up and still be the asset that I needed to be if and when I got back to the team. So that's what, that, that's what that looked like initially. And to kind of go full circle, when I did get off the plane in Afghanistan, two years later in Afghanistan um, for my first deployment as an APT, I was able to employ a lot of those skill sets um, and capabilities that I had forced myself to learn, which was painful, Ryan, because I really didn't enjoy it. So it was pure discipline and faith that enabled me to do those things but I was able to actually employ some of that stuff for the, for the greater good of the mission and for the team. And the second part of your question um, is, yeah, of course. I mean, that really was the catalyst for me to see the value in our, our brains being the, the most casualty producing weapon we have as human beings. Um, that is our greatest asset, is our brains and our ability to think and our intellect more so than how much I can bench press and how fast I can run. Those, those physical, tangible, quantifiable accomplishments really don't mean all that much uh, if you don't have the brain power to make the correct decisions at the right time and analyze your environment and you know, rapidly conduct risk assessment. All those things happen by increasing your cerebral capacity. So 
Um, yeah, I pursue that stuff to this day. Um, you know, kind of one of maybe the highlights to point on is, you know, about halfway through my master's degree in psychology, which, you know, is something that I've grown to be interested in. And I see value in that both as a Green Beret and then just throughout life, you know, understanding and appreciation for how people think and, and why people think a certain way. And then lastly, on this point is, you know, I'm reached out to constantly, Ryan, by, by aspiring uh, soft guys or gals, like, hey, I want to be a Green Beret, I want to do this, like, do you have any recommendations? And out of the gate, almost certainly, I'll ask, you know, what are you reading? And they typically don't expect that question coming back from me. They, again, their mind is more about maximum shift, physical. Phys physical capabilities, and, and this aggressive go-getter attitude, and, and those are all important, but what are you reading? Tell me about what you're studying, because again, I don't, I, I need you to be able to run fast, but more than that, I need you to be smart and educated and have a high degree of intelligence that, that you can use your brain effectively within these high stress environments. So I can't possibly undervalue how important that is, whether you want to come into soft or whether you're already in it, or really regardless of what sector you're within, you know, I challenge people to be pushing those, those cerebral capacities um, every single day. So speaking of what are you reading, I wanted to pick your brain on your book, Objective Secure. Where can listeners buy a copy? And then more importantly, not a sales pitch, but explain the book to listeners and, and, and what it's about and, and why it's a good re read for them. Yeah, man. Currently, it's available on Amazon, um, although we're about to have some signed hardcover copies available Perfect. through our website, which is machinenick.com. I anticipate that being good to go in about a month. Um, and then I think the easiest way and the, the most concise way to explain the book is really just the, the, the genesis of it. And this really began following my 2015 deployment as an amputee for the first time. And the waves of questions were starting to come in and I was getting more and more gradually into the public space, social media, which was a struggle, but I eventually started putting myself out there and the questions were coming in and a lot of them were the same. It was, how did you do what you did? Or how do you do what you do with one leg? And as I'm answering those questions by the hundreds and soon by the thousands, I just decided to wrap up that answer to that question in a very simple, concise word document to be able to just copy and paste it and send it to people just to purely on efficiency but then also give them a better response, something I actually spent some time thinking about. So I created something that was very basic and simple, maybe six, seven, 10 pages. It was just an outline. It was just a guide, you know, and I talked about like mentality, discipline, structure, kind of some more X's and O's type tactics, some tools I used, packaged it up. And I used it that way for maybe a year or two until, you know, a really good buddy of mine, been friends for over 20 years, played college football together. He approached me in 2020 and said, hey, I think that you need to write a book. And I wanted nothing to do with it. You know, I was like, no, I'm not an author. You know, this is, I don't do that. But we were in the midst of COVID and I had a lot of extra time and energy on my hands because even in the military, we were doing a lot of teleworking and weird limited hours. We could be in the team room. So I had extra time and energy that I otherwise wouldn't have had. And I sat there and I thought about what he recommended. And I just said, you know what? I kind of already have this product that I've been using and the feedback has been really beneficial. And he said, cool, man, let's go with that. So he and I just kind of played around with it a bit over the months beginning around July of 2020. And I was deploying in December of 2020. So I gave myself that a lot of time to just see what I could come up with. And, you know, I got real obsessed with it. And, you know, I found myself waking up at three o'clock in the morning. I just had to write, which was weird for me to just even feel that. Um, but I started knocking out in five, 600 words a day. And I just got into a rhythm. Fast forward three, four months. And I'm sitting on, you know, like 70,000 words. And now you've got something that actually has the, at least the contents of a book. So it still is very much exactly what it intended to be back when I wrote that nine page Microsoft Word document. I've added some personal vignettes and some examples and some things to give readers a little bit of context. But the, the greatest piece of negative feedback I've received, I've received so far, which is good to hear, is people want like more of my story. People want the autobiography. People want 
a more in-depth look at pre-military me with two legs like more detail on the events revolving around me getting wounded that's not what this project has ever intended to be that's not what this is if you're looking for that kind of in-depth look into me personally objective secure is not the product for you objective secure is a personal development piece that focuses on goal achievement through overcoming adversity and it's just a simple guide and methodology and philosophy and a series of tools to enable people to really do that. It's curious that you mentioned the negative feedback kind of feeds you. What I want to talk with you about is the positive feedback. You have a book out, you have a YouTube channel, you've been a, on guests on a bunch of different podcasts, the TED Talk. You've impacted, I think this is low, but thousands of lives. You've inspired thousands of people how do you feed off of that how does that impact you when, when someone emails you when someone's if they stop you on the street or something or, or they come up to you and they explain how you made a difference in their life how does that kind of hit with you yeah man um thank thank you for that ryan it, it, it's impactful uh to me it's it's extraordinarily humbling you know, it's an honor, you know, and again, you know, back on into, into 2011 really was when I decided I wanted to live a life of service to a society, um, you know, really as a warrior. But as I've as I've developed and matured over the last 15 years in uniform, you know, I've realized that that, that I can continue to be that that servant um, outside of, you know, being in combat zones. So it's still on uncomfortable to a degree that I'm in this kind of limelight because, you know, I do believe in the quiet professional mentality and, and being a man of action. And, and I don't really need the focus, but I have determined that because of what I've been through, I've identified that I have an obligation and a responsibility to share that with others to enable the next guy or gal that's struggling with something. So I, I've taken on this as a responsibility, but it will almost certainly always feel a little, a little awkward for me um, to get that kind of response. And then, you know, the specific feedback, dude, it, it's ranged from something as simple, which is great is, Hey man, I, I, you've been a great source of motivation. Like I crushed my workout this morning, thanks to you, which is awesome. And then kind of on the father, other end of the spectrum, just a few weeks ago, you know, I got an email from a woman who, who told me that her husband had attempted suicide and fortunately he failed at that. Um, and she had seen me and she, she ordered a copy of my book and she got it in front of him and she decided to reach out to me to tell me that having done so he's, he's turned things around and he's really doing well. Not to say that I am the reason behind that, but just from her perspective that I played even just a small role in that kind of reversal, dude, I don't know how you quantify that kind of feedback. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, to say it's impactful will be an understatement. Sometimes it can get pretty heavy with stuff like that. But, you know, I've assembled a really great team around me that that are all passionate about this initiative. And we have all, even though this is a, a nights and weekends things for us right now, we all have day to day jobs. We all have families. We all see that this is our future. And we are in a blessed position that while we all currently enjoy what we're doing, we all know what our next passion and purpose is once we scale to a point where that becomes what we do full time. So we're in for we're in for a fun ride here, man. And I'm looking to watch how this thing grows and we can continue to reach out and positively affect, you know, those within the society that I pledged an allegiance to now 15 years ago. Nick, thank you for your time today. Thank you for um, sharing with listeners a bit of your story, and, and I'm sure it's going to give them some encouragement. So thank you for your time today. Likewise, Ryan. I appreciate it, man. Thank you.